It was in 1937 that the Nazi dictator, Adolf Hitler, conceptualized a Volkswagen, translating in English as a people's car. He dreamt of building something similar to America's Ford Model T from 1906 and the Fiat 500 Topolino from 1936. The project was led by the reputed Austrian-German engineer, Ferdinand Porsche. By 1938, a prototype called the KDF, or Kraft Dirch Freude Wagen, appeared, standing for Strength Through Joy Car. It was capable of transporting two adults and three children at the speed of 100 km per hour, and its speculated price was $7,300. However, World War II began in 1939 and the focus shifted to war. After the war ended, though, the British occupation took interest in the Wolfsburg factory that had produced the Type 82 Kubelwagen and the Type 166 Schwimmwagen military vehicles during the war. Although they initially planned to salvage this plant as war reparations, it somehow survived and the British placed an order of 20,000 Type 1 Beetles. In March 1946, Volkswagen set the record of producing 1,000 Beetles in one month. Exports to French and British administration also began soon, while exports for private buyers began in 1949. The Type 2 transporter was released in 1949 and the Carmon Ghia Sports Coupe in 1955. By 1960, Volkswagen was exporting CBU or completely built units, and CKD or complete knockdown units, as well as manufacturing outside West Germany for foreign sales. Australia, America, Canada, France, and the United Kingdom counted significantly towards their sales. The East Germans even attempted to replicate the Beatles' success with their Trabant 500, built at Auto Union's former Chemnitz and Zwickau plants. Furthermore, the French and the Italians had now come up with their own success stories of the Citroën 2CV from 1948 and the Fiat Nuovo 500 from 1957 respectively. The British Motor Corporation were slightly late to the party with their Austin Morris Mini, releasing in 1959. Moreover, Volkswagenwerk Gesellschaft's Meet Beschränkter Haftung, standing for Volkswagen Works Limited Liability Company transitioned into a public limited company in 1957, named Volkswagenwerk Aktiengesellschaft. Nonetheless, Volkswagen was now a major global power, contributing greatly to Germany's automotive supremacy. The chart you see graphs Germany's total automobile output versus the Volkswagen Group's total automobile output throughout the decades. The auto union existing in 1965, was but a shadow of its former self. Founded in 1932, it was a union of four carmakers, namely, Wanderer, DKW, Audi, and Hora. Since their headquarters and plants in Chemnitz and Zwickau, in the East German province of Saxony, were acquired by the Soviets, the administration and workforce fled to Ingolstadt, Bavaria to restart Auto Union in 1949. They couldn't reiterate their success of the 1930s and were consequently, acquired by Daimler-Benz AG in 1960. Shockingly, Daimler-Benz completely sold off Auto Union to Volkswagen in 1965, thus transferring the ownership. This was despite Daimler's recent investment in Auto Union, amounting to $928 million. This deal worked in favor of VW as it revived the Audi brand as a premium carmaker under its umbrella, with successful models such as the 80 and the 100 appearing right from the start. In 1969, Volkswagen acquired another German brand, the NSU Motorenwerk AG. NSU's R080 sedan and previous rotary engine cars may be accredited as factors of its bankruptcy. It was expensive to research for such an unconventional engine, while the Mark's goodwill was plagued by the rotary engine's infamous durability. Thus, Volkswagen now owned Audi NSU Auto Union AG, shortened to Audi AG in 1985. It wouldn't be an understatement to call Porsche a sibling of Volkswagen. Founded by Volkswagen's lead designer himself, Porsche's sports cars had used Beetle components during the 1940s and 50s. Moreover, the two companies had an agreement that helped them collaborate on an entry-level sports car, the 914. While Volkswagen sold the Boxer inline four-engine 914 sports cars, Porsche sold them as 914-6 with Boxer inline six engines. Additionally, this partnership helped Porsche prosper in America, as it was allowed VW's Audi dealer network. Next, Volkswagen assisted Porsche in producing the 912e, 924 and 944. Even in the next millennium, Porsche's first SUV, the Cayenne, used the same chassis as the Audi Q7 and Volkswagen Touareg. Foreshadowing what Volkswagen was intending to do, they signed a cooperation agreement with the Spanish carmaker, Sociedad Española de Automóviles de Turismo, Sociedad Anónima, or SEAT, SA in 1982. 
Eventually, the Germans acquired a controlling stake in the Spanish, and Seat became a fully owned subsidiary of VW by 1991. Seat's German parent provided it with fresh vehicles such as the Ibiza hatchback in 1984, the Malaga sedan in 1985, and the Corboda in 1993. As the capitalistic West and the communist East Germany united in 1991, Volkswagen took control of Trabant's chief factory, called HQM Saxonring GmbH. Since, it has supplied Volkswagen's other plants with parts for the Golf and Passat models. The second non-German acquisition followed in the form of Škoda, the Czech government-owned carmaker, formerly plagued by the socialist government's unprofitable policies. Twenty carmakers presented their interest in acquiring Škoda, but merely eight were considered. Amongst BMW, Daimler-Benz, General Motors, Volvo, Ford and Fiat, only Volkswagen and Renault were shortlisted. Renault's initial offer deprived Škoda of an individual identity under the new ownership, and the Czech couldn't digest this. Although Renault was given a second chance to present new offers, Volkswagen won it with their proven corporate competence. Initially acquiring a 31% share, Škoda became a wholly owned subsidiary of VW by 2000 for a cumulative price of $123.48 billion. The last Škoda model before VW's intervention was the favorite, infamous for its bad quality. However, Škoda ascended in this aspect with its VW-funded projects of Felicia 1994, and the best-selling Octavia 1996. Volkswagen further purchased the British Bentley Mark, whose unique identity was compromised under Rolls-Royce, during its Vickers ownership. At the time, BMW appeared to be the natural inheritor of both the Marcus, granted the cordial relationship it had developed by supplying V8 and V12 engines. However, Volkswagen's bid of $1.02 billion, dwarfed BMW's $803.48 million. Quoting Bentley's newsroom, the acquisition of Bentley by the Volkswagen Group in 1998 added resource, new technologies and even greater impetus to the momentum of the Bentley renaissance. It was announced Bentley and Rolls-Royce would be separate companies once again, after 67 years together. Volkswagen AG announced it would invest £500 million in the Bentley Mark, its crew factory and the building of an all-new Bentley. This also substantiated Bentley's intention to maintain a thoroughly British bloodline. Throughout the years, Bentley had depended on BMW for its engines. Thus, Volkswagen had to convince BMW for a deal that would allow the former to utilize BMW engines until 2003, by which time, the Silver Seraf was discontinued. Simultaneously, BMW incorporated the new entity of Rolls-Royce Motor Cars Limited that initiated a new phase in the life of the British luxury symbol. Nevertheless, with the Continental GT releasing in 2003, Bentley was back on tracks again. It wasn't over for the German conglomerate yet, as they were about to intervene in the French matter of Bugatti. A classic high-performance brand from the early days of racing that had gone defunct in 1963, revived in 1987 to produce some spectacular concepts and the equally spectacular EB110, only to go defunct again in 1995. Yes, that was Bugatti in the word's truest sense. Volkswagen purchased this mark in 1998, and produced the ludicrous 1000 bhp, W16 engined, quad turbo, Veyron by 2005. Volkswagen reached Italy next, taking over Lamborghini. Since 1963, the brand had made marvelous motoring machines, but they were financially challenged. With the Diablo added to their portfolio during the American Chrysler's 1987-1994 ownership, Lamborghini now had Malaysian and Indonesian investors. Mycom Sedco and V-Power cooperation couldn't uplift Lamborghini and it suffered worse sales. By 1998, the Italian brand was in search for a new hero. Enter Volkswagen's Audi, immersed in its quest of adding new names to its hall of acquisitions. In 1998, Audi bought Lamborghini for $175.41 million. This deal was justified, considering Lamborghini yearned to equip the Diablo's supposed successor with the Audi A8's a 4.2 V8 in 1997. Quoting Maurizio Reggiani, Lamborghini's chief technical officer from an interview conducted by Matte Petrani on Hagerty Media's automotive history, no doubt, Audi arrived just in time in 1998 to turn Lamborghini's fortunes around. Peach was buying up premium brands like there was no tomorrow in that era, but the Lamborghini deal was not some childish impulse buy. He recognized that Lamborghini had a solid team of capable engineers, but that the storied Italian brand needed confident leadership to move forward. With Lamborghini's know-how in its toolkit, Audi would be able to take its performance aspirations to the next level into the new millennium and beyond.
By 2000, Volkswagen Group presented a strong portfolio of the three budget carmakers, Seat, Skoda and Volkswagen, a luxury portfolio of Audi and Bentley, and a sporty portfolio of Lamborghini and Bugatti. However, their aspirations drove them towards the heavy vehicles market. In 2000, VW bought some stakes in Volvo, but through a series of deals ending in 2015, they were able to acquire Scania Aktiebolag, Swedish for Scania Joint Stock Company. Similarly, in 2011, Volkswagen attained a voting status at MAN SE, or Maschinenfabrik Augsburg Nuremberg Societas Europea. Through a complex series of strategically purchasing and selling of shares, the Volkswagen Group currently owns MAN, Scania and Volkswagen Kamenhose e Onibus brands, under its Traten SE subsidiary. With such prominent truck and bus makers under its belt, Traten is the world's third greatest heavy vehicles manufacturer, behind Daimler-Benz and Volvo. Later, it was in 2004 that Volkswagen noticed the niche of minivans to be fulfilled in the North American market. To do so, they resorted to an unusual friend, Chrysler LLC. I say unusual because Volkswagen doesn't maintain significant former relations with Chrysler. Nonetheless, they allowed Volkswagen to rebadge their town and country minivan to sell as the Volkswagen Rutan in 2009. The same platform also houses the Dodge Grand Caravan and the Lancia Voyager. Furthermore, in 2009, Volkswagen offered to acquire a longtime partner, Wilhelm Karmann GmbH that had designed the famous Gia. The deal was complete by 2012, but Karmann never achieved the status of a distinct mark. Next year, Volkswagen acquired 90.1% stakes in Italdesign Jujaro through Audi's Lamborghini SP.A. Volkswagen maintains historic links to Italdesign because of cars such as the Golf and C Toledo, etc. The German maker's next stop was the Italian bike maker, Ducati, again acquired through Audi's Automobili Lamborghini SP.A. The transaction occurred in 2012 and was valued at $1.03 billion. Far east in VW's proven turf of China, they began a joint venture with FAO or First Automotive Works Group of China. Picking up the popular midsize sedan's name, Jetta, they created a new brand out of it. Since the start in 2020, they sell only three models as of yet. The Jetta VA3, essentially a facelifted Jetta sedan, the Jetta VS5, a rebadged Skoda Karak, and finally the Jetta VS7, a rebadged Skoda Kodiak. The two companies had peacefully existed for long. However, Wendelin Wiedking, Porsche's CEO from 1993 until 2009, visioned profit above all else, as described by the automobile mag. His quest for Porsche to take over Volkswagen began in 2005, as he increased Porsche's 5% stake in VW, to 20%. By 2008, that percentage rose to 42.6%, when Wiedking admitted to wanting 75%. That would be the stage where Volkswagen would suffer a profit transfer, something that occurs in case of a parent-subsidiary relationship. To contextualize, Porsche, an ant, wanted to take over the mammoth, Volkswagen. Had it gone according to the plan, the profit transfer would have enriched Porsche with an instant $13.76 billion. However, similar to Icarus, Wiedking's wax wings melted during the Great Recession of 2009, when his lenders demanded back their $15.75 billion of unpaid loans. Alas, Volkswagen turned out to be the one saving Porsche by establishing a merger that finished in 2011. In light to Wiedking's other contributions, the succeeding Porsche VW administration declared the Cayenne and Panamera sacrilegious to Porsche's sporty heritage. Finally summarizing Volkswagen's chief subsidiaries, we have Volkswagen, Skoda, Audi, Porsche, Bentley, Lamborghini, Bugatti, Ducati and Traton. I dearly thank you for watching my first ever video until the end. Do leave your opinions regarding the topics covered, and kindly provide me feedback on my style and content. You may find several other posts of this intensity on my Drive Tribe profile, and Car Spots, amongst other things on my Instagram, both in the description below.